Frauen hier hat Frau Matzlael gewagt. seven other dimensions that are hidden from us that are hidden from our eye anyone who is following a specific path in religion has his fingers in his ears has his hands in front of his eyes and he doesn't want to see and he doesn't want to hear the majority of people today following the three major religions have absolutely no idea of the religion. The only people, the only people that would understand are what men, the Quran is mentioning as Ulul Albab, men of understanding. So we have free will, every single person has free will. But our free will and our control of our surrounding can get stronger and stronger if we start to purify our naps. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و به نستعین اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم والعصر ان الانسان لفی خوب الا الذین آمنوا و عملوا الصالحات و تواصوا بالحق و تواصوا بالصبر لا حول ولا قوت الا بالله العلی العظیم سلام عرض می کنم uh, assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters viewers of Salam TV We are going to continue our program regarding the history of Christianity And an investigative look into the Old and New Testament To find out, number one, truth about the doctrine of Christianity being that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was or was not crucified? Did he resurrect? Did he say that by believing in my death and my resurrection, and my believing, by believing that my blood was shed to, for forgiveness of humanity sins by God, and that everyone believe in my resurrection and my death and my blood shedding would go to heaven and would be resurrected in the heaven. Is such a thing as a trinity? Is such a thing as a cross? These are things we need to investigate and find out how much of it is true and how much of it is just invention by a fake apostle who called himself Apostle of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. As you are aware, and you have been used to my programs, I have never mentioned anything whenever I talked about Quran and science, whenever I talked about Wahhabism, whenever I talked about any subject you have never seen me talking without reference, talking without having any proof, never. And inshallah, that would be my policy as long as I have programs on Salam TV. In the Quran, Surah Furqan, Ayah number 31, Surah Furqan, in Surah number 25, in verse 31, God says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلَّ نَبِيًّا أَدُوَّنْ مَنَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ وَكَفَى بِرَبِّكَ هَادِيًّا وَنَسِيرًا The translation in English, Even so have we appointed, 
unto every prophet an opponent from among the guilty, but Allah suffers for a guide and helper. That means that every single prophet of Allah had an enemy from the rank of the guilty, mujrimin. It doesn't say kafirin, mushrikin. You see, it doesn't mention that they are kafir. It means they are people that believe in God. Those are people that believe in God. But they are guilty. They are guilty because they want to change the message. They want to deviate the message for their own personal reasons. They are mujrim. They are guilty. You see, somebody is guilty of a crime, somebody guilty of theft. People can be guilty of a lot of things. And some people are guilty of deviation, of trying to deviate the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his prophets. So God is telling us to be careful because there are some people around you that are trying to deviate the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again in Surah Furqan, Surah number 25, Ayah number 33, and it says, And they bring the no simulated, but we bring you the truth and better as argument. It means those people, those guilty ones and their followers, are trying to bring to you some reasons to convince you that their doctrine is the truth. But we give you, we also give you a doctrine that would destroy all their belief system and all their lies. We're going to give it to you and we're going to give it through Quran. And if you read the ayahs in the Quran and if you follow the way God is asking you to investigate your belief, you would find out extremely easily the lies that exist in the Old and the New Testament. All you need to do is to read it with an investigative mind, with a curious mind, not being fanatic, not being obsessed with the belief system that have been pushed and forced into your mind by your parents and your church and your elders. The only way, brothers and sisters, to find the right path, the sirat mustaqim is to look at things with an open mind. But to have an open mind, you need to have open eyes and open ears. You need to gather information and then analyze them and find out what is true and what is false, what is from God and what is from shaitan. And it's extremely simple, brothers and sisters, very, very simple, as long as, as long as you let go of your ancient beliefs, things that have been forced to your mind by the society. You have to let go, become fresh, and start thinking. If you look at the Gospel, the New Testament, if you look at the book of Revelation, Revelation, book 2, verse 2, it says, And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Revelation, book 2, verse 2. Basically, it's saying the same thing as we saw in Surah Furqan, ayah number 31. That for every prophet, we had someone from the group of guilties that are trying to change the message. Here in the book of Revelation, book 2, verse 2, we have exactly the same thing. That some people are telling you that we are apostle of prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. 
but you would find out that they are liars. Now, how we, can we find out that someone that is telling he is an apostle, he is lying? And thank God, it's so simple. It is so simple to prove who an apostle is and who those apostles are that are saying they are the apostles of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, but people would find out that they were a bunch of liars. And if you remember, I said many, many times in my programs that that apostle that was lying and which is mentioned in the book of Revelation, book 2, number 2, verse 2, is nobody else than Paul or Paulus or Shaul or Solus. Shaul or Paul or Paulus. But let's call him Paul the same way he's mentioned in the New Testament. Was Paul an apostle of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him? Very simple question, very simple answer. Was he an apostle? No, he was not. Then how it is that 1.2 billion Christians around the world are following the doctrine of a person who was not an apostle of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and never saw him. And not only he never saw him, he was never an apostle, but he was killing the followers of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, the most important martyr that was killed by Paul being Saint Stephen. In the book of Acts, Paul himself is telling that he helped people that were stoned to death, St. Stephen. And he was helping them. And he was the person who arrested him and gave him to court, to the court to be judged and be killed by stoning. And he says in the New Testament that he was hired by the temple, by the Sadducees and the Roman Empire to go after the followers of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, to arrest them and bring them to justice. Actually, to bring them to the injustice. But to him was justice. Then we have to ask ourselves this question. If he was not an apostle, how did he become an apostle? What happened? And you would be amazed. And you would be amazed to see that he proclaimed himself an apostle. He was a self-proclaimed apostle. Nobody approached him. He invented a story. He invented a story that from the road to Jerusalem, from in the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, he saw a vision. He had a vision. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, came to him. And no, I mean, there are a lot of witnesses, but this event has never been written in any history. It's just a saying of Paul. That I saw Prophet Jesus in a vision. In the road from Jerusalem to Damascus. And I want to repeat this because it is so important. That in three books of the New Testament. I mean, in three chapters of the New Testament, in the book of Acts, number 9, number 22, and 26, go and read for yourself. Paul is explaining the way that vision happened. And we see that there are so many controversies and so many contradictions in those three stories. In one of them, Paul is telling us, Nobody saw the light besides me. I was the only one who saw the light, but everybody heard the sound. In another one, he said, everybody saw the light, but I was the only one who heard the sound. In one of them, he said, he was the only one who fell on the ground. And in another one, he says, everybody fell on the ground. But 200 soldiers were with Paul when he was leaving from Jerusalem to Damascus. 
Now imagine you as a person. You are going somewhere and suddenly and 200 people are with you. And suddenly a light from the sky come to you. And his prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. I mean, this event is so shocking. And this event is so unique that you would remember every single day. There is absolutely no way you can be in the middle of 200 people. And in one story say, I was the only one who fell on the ground. Everybody else was on their horses or standing. And in another story, you see 200 people prostrating, falling on the floor, falling on the ground. This is not something that you can make a mistake. As human, in a court of law, if someone is lying, they would try to interrogate him many, many times with many different people. And if there are too many contradictions, in his testimonies, the rule of law would convict him. Because when you have too many contradictions in someone's testimony, that concludes that he is lying. So even if we consider the human law, we can definitely say that Paul was lying. In one story, he told everybody that he became blind, he went to Damascus, a, name, a person by the name of Ananias touched his eye and he could see. And over there, Ananias told him what he needs to do because Prophet Jesus told Ananias that Ananias had to tell Paul what he has to do. Another one in Act 26, he's telling us that in the road, Prophet Jesus told him everything he needs to know. What is his mission? In one, everything is told to him in Damascus, and the other one, everything was told to him by Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, in, on the road to Damascus. Now, let's, if we look at Romans, the book of Romans, book number 3, verse number 7. You can go check for yourself. In my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Two things we can understand from this verse. First of all, he's admitting that he's a liar. He's admitting. He says, if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. It means, yes, I'm lying. I'm a liar. But if through my lies, I can bring God to his glory, why are you calling me a sinner? That means he was called a sinner. By who? By the Jews by people who were following the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments. People that were following the laws of the Old Testament. He was called a sinner. So two facts can be drawn from this verse. Romans book 3, verse number 7. Number he is admitting he is a liar. And number 2, he is admitting that he was called a sinner. In Philippians, the letter to Philippians, book number 1, verse number 18, he says, In every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Jesus is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Again, admitting himself that it doesn't matter what I say. It can be a lie. I can pretend. I don't care if it's true or not, as long as I can bring more followers behind me to follow my doctrine. I don't care if, it's pre if I'm pretending, if I'm lying, or if I'm saying the truth, or people are calling me a sinner, as long as I can bring followers for my doctrine. In the book of Acts, Paul was traveling through cities that were pagan believers. And as I mentioned in my previous programs, 
they were many gods at that time in the Roman Empire. You had the most important being Mitra and Mitraism, the pagan belief of Mitraism. You had Attis, son of Sibel. You had Isis. You had Osiris. You had Dionysus. You have many, many Adonis. You have many, many gods. And the amazing thing is, almost all of these gods had a brutal death and they resurrected on the third day, all of them. So Paul started preaching about his doctrine. And of course, nobody believed in him. Nobody. And he saw that his job is becoming more and more difficult to find followers. And he knew that those people were followers of pagan gods. And they believed in the resurrection, the third day resurrection. So what he says, he says, Christus my God, Christus my God, died and was resurrected on the third day. As soon as he said that, as soon as he said that, a lot of people started following him. The amazing thing is, in the book of Acts, the name of one of the persons that started following Paul is even mentioned. Dionysius. Dionysius was one of the persons who followed Paul after what he said about the brutal death and the resurrection on the third day. Dionysius being one of the pagan gods. So a person's name being Dionysius, you know exactly what type of God he was following. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. That the book of Matthew, book of Matthew 33 I mean, book 5, 33 to 37, verses 33 to 37, I'm going to read it for you. But I say to you, this is Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, talking. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is this is from the evil one. You see how Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is talking? And if you compare that to the way Paul is talking. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, he says, when you say yes, is yes. When you say no, is no, and don't swear. Because any time you swear, that means what you are saying is coming from the evil one. And you can easily, by reading the New Testament, very easily you can see what is coming from a prophet of God, because it resembles, it's very close to what you have in the Quran, in what you have in the saying of Prophet Moses and all the other prophets. You see, the, the strength of the word. You can see that this is coming from a prophet. Not like Paul, who says, if through my lie, God's glory is increased, then why are you calling me a sinner? That means I'm lying and I'm a sinner. He says, even if it's true, or if I'm pretending something, as long as Jesus is mentioned, who cares? Now put those two things in, side by side. You see the strength of the word of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and the weak words of a false apostle called Paul. In the book of Timothy, book 1, I mean Timothy 1, Timothy 1, book 2, verse 7. For this I was appointed a preacher. That's again Paul, Paul talking. For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. 
a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. One more, once more, Paul is telling his followers that I'm not a liar. I'm not lying. Why have you ever seen one time, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, even one time, saying that he was not a liar? That he was not lying and swearing. But so many times in the New Testament, you have Paul repeating, I'm not a liar. I'm not lying. I'm not a sinner. He says in the Romans book 9 verses 1 to 3, I'm speaking, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. Again, he says, I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. Once again, Paul repeating that he is not lying. In the letters to Corinthians, Corinthians 2, book 11, verses 31, 32, and 33. Again, this is Paul talking. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I do not lie. You see, he's swearing by God and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, that he is not a liar. And you saw what Prophet Jesus says in Matthew. He says, whenever you swear, you know that what you are saying is coming from the evil one. I mean, what else do you need? I'm telling you, it's very simple to find the truth. As long as, as long as you let go of your, of your ancient beliefs and you are not a fanatic. As long as you say you let the fanaticism go and you become open-minded, you can see the truth and it's extremely simple. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to seize me. Again, this is Paul talking. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. So listen carefully. Events are happening in Damascus. King Aretas was guarding the city and was trying to arrest Paul. But he was let down through a window in the wall and escaped. Now the same story, the same story. So one, the same event that was told by Paul in different parts of the New Testament. So in one of them, he said that King Aretas wanted to arrest him. So they let him down through a window in a basket and he escaped. Now the same thing. When many days had passed, the Jews now plotted to kill him. It's not the king Aretas anymore. The Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down over the wall. No more windows here. No more windows. Now the same story, the same event. And you're going to see the contradictions. But when he had set me apart before I was born and had called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and again I returned to Damascus. So they were trying to catch him, to arrest him. He escaped, and here in the book of Galatians, book 1, verses 15 to 20, he's telling us that when he escaped, he went to Arabia, and then he returned to Damascus. And then, he says, then after I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained within, with him 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Again, he says, in what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. I'm so amazed, brothers and sisters, to see Paul lying one after the other when he is telling us the events, lying, 
so many times and always finishing his sentences, I do not lie. Now here, so in Galatians, he said that he went to Arabia. And Ananias said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the just one and to hear a voice from his mouth. And you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now here, you see, Paul is still in Damascus. In the other, the book of Galatians, he says that from Damascus, I went into Arabia. Into Arabia. And then I came back to Damascus. Now here, he says that he went back to Jerusalem. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem because they will not accept testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in very synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of Stephen, the witness, was shed, I also was standing by and approving and keeping the garments of those who killed you, killed him. And he said to me, depart, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Same event. But here he goes to a trance and see he saw prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, telling him that they are trying to kill him. And his disciple took him by night and let him down over the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. But they are all afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. That's the book of Acts 9, 25 to 30. So you see, in one story, he goes from Damascus into Arabia. Three years later, he comes back to Damascus, and then he goes to Jerusalem. Now here, he's telling us, that right away after Damascus, when they plotted to kill him, he went back to Jerusalem. In the other one, he said, I didn't see anyone else that Cephas and James, the brother of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. James and Cephas. Now here in the book of Acts 9.25-30, book 9, 25 to 30, it says, But Barnabas and brought, brought him to the apostles. Over there, he said, the only people who saw that he saw was Cephas and James the brother of Prophet Jesus. Here he says, Barnabas took him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenist Jews. But they were seeking bread. And when her bread and knew it, they brought him down to Caesarea and set him off to Tarsus. One after the other, brothers and sisters, I showed you the lies of Paul. And how amazingly, every time he's lying, he is mentioning, I am not lying. I'm not a liar. Even though he says he's not a liar and he's not lying, he himself, he says, if through my lies, if through my lies, God's glory is mentioned, then why are you calling me a sinner? If through my lies, he's accepting. He says, if in truth or in pretense, it means if I say a truth or if I lie, the name of Jesus is mentioned, who cares? Who cares if I lie or if I say the truth, as long as the Jesus name is mentioned? Now we're going to look at Galatians, book 1, verse number 10. Am I seeking the favor of men? Or of God? He's asking a question. Paul. Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. So Paul is telling in the Galatians, book 1, number 10, if I were to please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. Okay. Makes sense. But in Corinthians, Corinthians 1, 10, verse 32 and 33. He says, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, 
just as I try to please all men in everything I do. Subhanallah. In one verse, in Galatians book 1 verse 10, he says that if I try to please all men, I would not be a servant of Christ. In the book of Corinthians 1, book 10, verse 32 and 33, he says, I try to please all men in everything I do. Honestly, if I was a follower of Paul Christianity, that would be enough for me. That would be enough for me to start thinking. Now something, more is coming, brothers and sisters, more is coming. Now usually we, for us, what is important is honesty. Usually when we try to rank people, we say, I like that person because he's a straight shooter. Whatever is in his heart, he's telling you. And he's not changing face depending where he is. He's a straight shooter. He's an honest man. Now let's see what Paul, how he's describing him, what kind of a man he is. In Corinthians 1, book 9, verses 19 to 25. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. You see? I would become a slave. I would lie. I would deceive. As long as I can bring more people to my doctrine. The Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's amazing. He says, even though I myself, I don't consider myself under the law. And in many verses in the New Testament, he says, the laws don't bring anything to you. And they are a curse to you. The laws are a curse to you. But here he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. Even though I don't care, they don't care about the law. That I might win those under the law. To those outside the law. I became as one outside the law, not being without law toward God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessing. Again, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, to me, if I was a fair Pauline Christian, that would be enough. Honestly, that would be enough. But we're going to continue. As I said, Paul created many doctrines in Christianity that were never mentioned, never, by Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and his apostles. And Paul got arrested many, many times by Jews because Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was a Jew. He was a Jew under the law. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, never, never said, forget about the law. He never said that the law is a curse on you. Never. There is not even one verse in the whole New Testament saying that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, asked people to forget about the law. Never. Then who did? Paul, the faithful apostle, the liar, the person who himself is calling himself a liar. A hypocrite because he becomes everything to all men to please them I don't know if you don't call it hypocrite go and look at the Oxford dictionary for the definition of a hypocrite 
Paul himself is qualifying himself as a liar and as a hypocrite. And still, he made the doctrines of Christianity. The death of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. His resurrection on the third day. Him being crucified. That people, by drinking wine and bread in representation of Jesus Christ's blood and flesh, would be born again and all their sins would be forgotten. And they would res be resurrected, be prophet Jesus in heaven. Another thing that Paul invented, pure invention of Paul, was the Last Supper. The Last Supper was invented by Paul to concede and to be at the same time as the Passover, one of the Jews' festivity. The Passover was when were asked by God to sacrifice a lamb and put a sign on their door so when the angels come to take the first male born in every, every Egyptian's house at the times of Pharaoh he would pass over the houses that they had the blood mark on their door pass over and to commemorate that day, Jews are still sacrificing a lamb in Passover. And because the Jews didn't have time to put, add yeast to their bread to make it complete, and they had to leave fast, so they don't put yeast in their bread on the, day, on the night of Passover. It's a tradition. To re for the remembrance of their relief and freedom from Pharaoh. Now Paul had to change this because Paul didn't want anything, didn't want anything in his new doctrine to be similar to Jewish traditions because he wanted to create a new doctrine that would be exactly as the doctrine that existed at the time of Roman Empire in the pagan cities and the pagan belief. As I said, the, goal, the goals were set before Paul started. Goal number one was to make sure no Jews would change his belief system and go and follow Paul because Paul deviated so much Prophet Jesus' doctrine that no Jews would follow him. So the Sadducees were happy because they would not lose their people so they would still collect their taxes and have a luxurious life. And Romans would, would be happy because anyone who would go to Poland Christianity would basically have the same religion as the pagan religion of the Roman Empire. Just the names would be changed. Atis would become Christ. Christ. Dionysus would, Dionysius would become Christ. But everything else was the same. In all mystery religions, they had a meal called Kuyakon Diepnon in Greek. Kuyakon Diepnon, which means the Last Supper. Exactly the same name that Paul used to say that on the night of Passover, Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed like the Jews were liberated from the Pharaohs. Jesus Christ is going to be sacrificed as a Lamb so his followers would be saved. So he created this idea of Last Supper, which was a totally pagan belief. And it was called Kuyakon Diepnon in Greek, Last Supper. Now Paul in his writings always called this ritual meat, meal with these two Greek words. And never the name Eucharist, which was the name of a Jewish meal at the night of Passover. He called it 
Huyakon Diepnon, exactly the same name that was used by the pagan believers who also had the Last Supper night. Baptism. Baptism existed at the time of Jews before Christianity. Never Jews would make a mistake against the law. They would be baptized. There were some ceremonial things they had to do. So their sins would be forgotten, like a repentance. And there were some ceremony they had to do. And John the Baptist was also doing this. But Paul made from that baptism a ritual that existed in the pagan belief. So he changed the Passover meal to the Last Supper. He made baptism, that was a Jewish ceremony, he made it a pagan ceremony. How? Now baptism, being buried, laying dead, rising from the dead, and walking in a new life is what an initiate of the mystery religion underwent in an initiation ceremony. Even before Christianity, in the pagan belief, to be born again, they had to be baptized. Implicate the death and resurrection of a deity to gain eternal life or salvation was the hallmark of pagan belief. The hallmark. Moreover, Paul's cultic baptism washed away inherent sins, another Hellenistic mystery ideology of pagan belief. And this whole idea, you can read it in the book of Romans, book 6, Verses 1 to 40, baptism. Now, the bapti baptism of pagan belief was done with blood. And it was called torobolium. Torobolium. It means the initiate would go inside the pit. They would sacrifice a ball. And if they didn't have enough money to buy a ball, they would sacrifice a lamb. The person would go inside the pit, wash himself with the blood of the sacrifice. So the sacrifice representing that deity, being Attis or Mitra or Adonis or Osiris or Dionysius. They all had the same pagan rituals, but they had different gods. So the person inside the pit would wash himself with the blood of that sacrificial animal representing that deity. And he would drink the blood, and he would eat the flesh of that sacrifice, of that animal. And he would be called born again. And he would have salvation. Exactly the same terms and the same rituals used today by the Pauline Christianity. They believe that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was died actually on the cross. His blood was shed. They drink the vine and eat the bread as a sign of the blood and the flesh of Prophet Jesus so they would be born again and get salvation. All those brothers and sisters are nothing but pagan belief. All this establishes further the congenital friendship among the savior cults, the identification of Attis with the seed that dies and is resurrected. And most significant of all, that in Attis, the Savior appears at last as a eunuch who requires celibacy from his devotees. Another thing that was absolutely common between all those gods was that they were dead and they were resurrected on the third day. They were resurrected on the third day. Exactly the same way that Paul was trying to implement this pagan belief into Christianity. What he called his God, Christ. As I said, Christ didn't exist in the Hebrew language. The anointed, it means the chosen one, the anointed. If you translate it in Greek, you, you get Christos. And you have so many Christos all over the Old Testament. Christos, that means the chosen. Even an object can be Christos because it has been chosen. So from Hebrew, it became to Christos. 
they got rid of the OS at the end. They made from the small C the capital C. And the Christos, meaning the chosen, that can be an object, it can be a plant, it can be any human being. Suddenly they create a society called Christ. Like Attis, like Adonis, like Osiris, like Mitra, like Dionysius. Like all those gods that existed at the time of the Roman Empire. Now the same way today, the Catholic Church is asking his followers and is asking the fathers of the church to stay single and not get married. This again, brothers and sisters, had nothing to do, nothing to do with Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, because if you look at the history, you know that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, had a very close relationship with Mary Magdalene. He had a very close relationship with Mary Magdalene. But Paul insisted because he wanted to follow step by step in God, he wanted to have celibacy in church. The same way that the followers of Attis would castrate themselves. So they would not get married. Castration was a part of the rituals to follow Attis. Now another interesting thing. Christian claimed the same dates for the conception and birth of the Savior. Now if you ask Christians why there are so many similarities in your belief system and the belief system of the pagans of Roman Empire, do you know what they would answer? And Tertullian being a philosopher, that's what he had to say. The, de the devil by the mysteries of his idols, imitates even the parts of the divine mysteries. Followers of Attis eventually lost their sacrificial day to the Christians. Tertullian basically is saying that evil saw what it is in Christianity, took it back in time, and showed that to the idol worshippers, to the pagan believers. So they would have the same belief system as Christians. So the Christianity would go under question. Have you ever heard something as stupid as that, brothers and sisters? That if someone comes and says, listen, I look at the history books, and every single ritual that you guys have in Christianity is exactly the same thing that existed in the pagan Roman Empire. The death of their deity, the resurrection at the third day, that he died, and by drinking his blood and his flesh, you would be born again and you have salvation. How come everything is the same? They would say, no, no, no. That's not the way to look at. Evil, shaitan, came, saw what it was in Christianity, took it back in time, showed it to those pagan believers, so actually they are imitating us. We are not imitating them. Even though they have been doing this for 2,000 years before us, but they are imitating us. Subhanallah. Now, another similitude between pagan belief and Christianity. They are celebrating Jesus Christ's birth on December 25th or 24th. Christmas, they call it. Every history book you read, every history book, every history book. They said Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was born in summer. Some say in June, some say in August. But everybody say he was born in summer. Why, why December 25th has become Christmas 
and the day Jesus Christ was born. Why? Amazingly, again, if you look at history, all those gods, Atis, Mitra, Dionysius, Osiris, Adonis, all of them were born on December 25th. All of them were born on December 25th. Why? Because all those deities, all of them, represented, represented light. All of them represented light. They said that those gods, those gods, they, they accepted that the universe and everything has been created by, by the God, the Supreme God. Even in the Quran, there is an ayah. It says to the Prophet, go and ask them those pagan believers, who created the whole universe? All those stars. They said God. They said God. That they believe. But what they say is that God created everything and now has absolutely nothing to do with the, with the universe. Nothing. We are on our own. So we need to have our own God now to protect ourselves. So they created some fake gods now for protection. For salvation. And because in the pagan beliefs, a lot of them were sun worshippers. They believed that their God was represented by sun because with the sunlight they could have agriculture, you know, they have they can have animals, and so so their life depended depended on light and fire. So light was extremely important to them for his light and his, and his heat. And because the nights were getting shorter and shorter, where they, those guys were living, lights, I mean the nights were getting shorter and shorter. Nights were getting, sorry, nights were getting longer and longer during the winter solstice up to December 24th. Starting at that time, the day would take over, the light would take over, and days would become longer and longer. We call it in the Persian culture, the Yalda night. They would call it the Yalda, Yald night. It means the longest night of the year. And from the next day, the nights would become shorter and shorter, and the days would become longer and longer. So to them, that special night was a special night because now the day would take over and would become longer and longer. So to them was the birth of their God's son, the light. All those gods representing the sun, so that would be his birth. So Paul did exactly the same thing and created this pagan belief in Pauline Christianity, that Prophet Jesus, like all those gods, was actually born on December 25th. And there are so many other similitudes, inshallah, we're going to talk about it more. Paul was always contradicting the laws of Moses, peace be upon him, in the Old Testament. He says, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You see here he considers the law being a curse on people. Something that was sent by God. Something that was sent by God. And Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, never mentioned anything against Paul is saying is a curse. Now, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy 6.25, Moses says, Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. Now, brothers and sisters, asking a simple question. Go to any bookstore and say, I want to buy a Bible. When you buy a Bible, you would have a book which has an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament having 39 books and the New Testament 27, a total of 66 books. 
how is it possible to have a book in your hand that you consider the word of God, which is not, that are totally contradicting itself, totally. In Deuteronomy 6.25, Prophet Moses says, you have to follow the law. This is the right path. And then the fake apostle Paul, it says, the law is a curse on us. Allah. And there are so many of those brothers and sisters. I mean, we can just talk about it days and days. Paul again says in Galatians, book 5, verse number 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, said, that the first commandment, the first law, is love, is the love of God. Love of God. Paul, this fake apostle, comes and says, no, 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 no. Forget about Prophet Moses. Forget about Prophet Jesus. Follow what I say. That the law is just one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew, if you look Matthew, book 22, Verses 36 to 40. Matthew, book 22, verses 36 to 40. They ask, here they ask Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Yeshua said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. So they ask Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, what is the first commandment? What is the law? He says, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But Paul says, the only thing you need to follow in the law, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the second is like it. That's Prophet Jesus not talking. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love of God, love of your neighbor. But for Paul, the love of God doesn't exist. The love of the neighbor is enough for him. Now there is a reason for that. There is a reason for that. In John 1, verse, book 5, number 3, verse number 3 describes how we are to fulfill the first and greatest commandment, which is the love of God. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So Prophet Jesus, once again, is emphasizing to His followers that I didn't come to change the law. I just came to put the religion of prophet Moses peace be upon him on the right path which has been totally deviated by the seducees by the seducees Jew the seducees people that were working hand in hand with the Roman Empire to destroy the religion so they can have a luxurious life like the Ro Roman Emperor like the Roman governor they wanted to live like them so the double taxation by the temple and by the Roman Empire made people so poor that those poor people were dying from hunger. Thousands of people actually died from hunger on that time and malnutrition. So Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, came and he is saying, I'm not here to change the law. And I'm telling you that the law is very easy to follow. His commandments are not burdensome. It's amazing. We have exactly the same thing in Islam. He says in Surah Baqarah, La ikraha din. No burdensome in religion. Now a lot of people are translating La ikraha din. It means compulsion in religion. Yes, that's one of the translations. The other translation is, there is absolutely nothing in religion that is hard for you. Makruh, ikrah, 
It means there is nothing in religion that your soul and your spirit can find burdensome. Nothing. God has made all the laws for your own benefit and is required to follow it. La ikraha fiddi. Exactly the same thing in book of John 1, book 5, number 3. Nothing in the laws of God, nothing is burdensome. As you see, brothers and sisters, I had more to talk about tonight, but uh, I uh, unfortunately, we ha just have two minutes left. I would just say one more thing. In, in Matthew 23, 9, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, says, Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he is in the heaven. He is in the heaven. Matthew 23, 9. In the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. It means God. And shall intend alterations in times and in law. So Prophet Jesus says, no one, no one shall be called father. In the New Testament, Matthew 23, 9. And in Daniel 7, 25 in the Old Testament. It says that someone would come and she would make, he would make alterations in times and in law. Now Paul, if you look at Corinthians 1, 4, 15. He, that's Paul talking. I became your father. Prophet Jesus 23, 5 says, anyone who says I'm your father is from evil. There's just one father, he's in the heaven. But Paul in Corinthians 1, 4, 15 says, I am your father. You see the contradiction between what he says and Prophet Jesus said? That's an alteration in law. Because this is the first commandment. There is just one God. He is in the heaven. Nobody shall be called father. He says, I am the father. Daniel says, the person, evil person who is coming, he's going to make alteration in the law and in time. What was the holy day? Even for Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, it was Saturday, Sabbath. That was the holy day. Prophet Jesus never changed that day. Who changed it to Sunday? Sunday, the day of sun. You see again the connection between pagan belief, the God of sun. Sunday. Who made that alteration in time? Your guess is right, Paul. Paul made this alteration in law and this alteration in time. The same way, the same way it was mentioned in Daniel 7.25. When they wanted to tell people, be careful. Okay, brothers and sisters, my time is up. Again, I wanted to emphasize. I'm not talking tonight about the Gospel of Barnabas. I'm talking about this New Testament that we have in our hands. Nothing today mentioned tonight was mentioned about the Gospel of Barnabas. Everything I was mentioned was from the New International Version of the Bible. Go and ask, go and ask your religious leaders to explain those contradictions in your Bible. And if you are smart enough, and if you are not a fanatic, and if you are not brainwashed, you would think. And inshallah, you would see the light. Thank you very much for listening to this program. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. seven other dimensions that are hidden from us that are hidden from our physical eye anyone who is following a specific path in religion has his fingers in his ears has his hands in front of his eyes and he doesn't want to see and he doesn't want to hear the majority of people today following the three major religions have absolutely no idea of the religion. The only people, the only people that would understand are what mentioned, or Quran is mentioning as Ulul Albab, men of understanding. So we have free will, every single person has free will. But our free will and our control of our surrounding gets stronger and stronger if we 
start to purify our nafs. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم مدیریت و کارکنان شبکه سلام هیچ گونه مسئولیتی در قبال مطالب مطرح شده از طرف سخنرانان و نامسازان میهمانان اطلاع دهان و مکالمات تلفنی بینندگان ندارند Disclaimer The management and staff of Salam TV are not responsible for the views and opinions of the speakers guests, advertisers, and callers to our live programs.